Hello, I'm going to watch some Doctor Who. Do you want to join me? I've got a friend to pick a story. They've also told me what it is they particularly like about this story. So as we watch, I'll chat to you and tell you a few thoughts and facts and observations. We're going to see by concentrating on the positive and the things to love and celebrate, the happy times and places, what it is they might have identified as being the particular strong points of this adventure. Okay, well, before we watch episode two, let's remind ourselves of the story we're watching, the reason it was chosen, and by whom. Hello, my name's Chris Boyle, and I'm a full-time A-level law teacher and an incredibly part-time comedian and podcaster. The story that I've chosen is The Day of the Daleks, and the reason I've chosen that is because I do have problems uh, with the third Doctor. Um, he should be my favourite. He's played by John Pertwee, he wears velvet jackets, he does incredibly complicated fight sequences whilst holding a glass of whiskey, and yet more often than not I find him a bit pompous and a bit superior, and it gets on my nerves. So I'm going to see if I can find the positives in a third Doctor story. So, night is drawing in, ghosts are around, let's uh, see if I can get through Day of the Daleks, episode two, without three gorillas storming in and holding me at gunpoint. Uh, in the hope that that doesn't happen, I'm going to press play in three, two, one, go. <laughs> I, I can already this early in, in the podcast slash video, I can see a theme developing where I press play and there's either a massive delay there's not either there is a massive delay in that time it's because it didn't actually kick in because the, the blu-ray player is behind me because of plugs it doesn't matter um, I love this title sequence Louis Marx of course wrote this what an odd career he has with Doctor Who he turns up and does Planet of Giants and that's an episode lopped off um, oh yes and the 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 Dalek lady woman here um, she actually fluffs. She says the same time, time zone, but because it's at the end of the episode, she's, uh, uh, she, she gets the ignominy of fluffing twice. Um, and again, if, if, you're, if you're like Gypsy Kemp's character, if you're uh, you know, on the radio and you go, oh, so it's, it's the same time, time zone, you, you can sort of, you get away with that because it's, you know, people stumble. Uh, in fact, people stumble in real life much more than they do in drama. But if you are a staccato alien wax lady, uh, <laughs> I think that's the one time you can't stumble to add a bit of naturalism to uh, proceedings. And of course, typically, that's what happens typically at the end of the episode. Um, uh, the, the shiny faces thing is, is, is interesting uh, because if it was, the, if it was just the, the sort of waxy space future ladies, um, you could sort of go, well, they've undergone some sort of Dalekoid conversion, but uh, but the controller's quite waxy-faced as well. It's like they're cosplaying as Autons. Uh, ah, and of course that's weird, isn't it? The uh, the, the the playing of the, the theme sting, uh, uh, which is not something repeated before or since, which means I'm, I'm, I sort of like it because I like it when they do different things. Look at the depth of that set. The way that the Dalek set is positioned, obviously in the floor layout, which means that, because that's not going to be a whole set behind them, but because of the angles, it, it gives you a real sense of scale. And the size of the doors, which are quite small because they're Dalek sized, but depending on where you stand, they give a different, a, a different sort of feel. Um, is really interesting stuff because, uh, Often Doctor Who uses height to suggest things that are imposing or scary or a sense of scale. Whereas here, actually, those small doors, um, well, they do give a sense of scale depending on where they're shot, but also the times when the controllers uh, 
sort of going through them and they seem very small and that makes them sort of slightly cramped and disorienting. It's, it's what they do with scale in, this, in the set design, particularly in the future. Uh, the set design and the direction working in synthesis, I think is really interesting. And then you throw in the vision mixing where there are fades and there are cuts from, you know, a shot of a person to that shot then being in a monitor. I think is is some really good quality visuals. Now here's a thing: um, Anna Barry playing a gnat. Uh, uh, and, and she done she done bits of Teddy going back going back quite a long way. But uh, she was the daughter of she's still still the daughter of well he's no longer with us uh, Michael Barry who was the head of drama. Uh, at the BBC in the 50s, responsible for hiring, among many, Rudolf Cartier, who directed the Quatermass serials and uh, who I will frequently ask people about working with in my podcast, as certain people have pointed out. <laughs> Jonathan Morris. Um, it's like, uh, yes, yeah, so there's like a drinking game. If you listen to my Who's Round podcast, what was it? Did you work with Rudolf Cartier, of course? Um, so Rudolf Cartier, along with the words verisimilitude and beguiling, are ones that, uh, 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 if there was a drinking game for the stuff that I whack out to you, uh, would would probably be worth several tumblers full. So I will try and avoid them. But Anna Barry, yeah, is the is the daughter of Michael Barry. She was in a film called a short film that won an Oscar a couple of years ago, The, the Silent Child. I watched it because it was about a, a deaf child, and I have a a, a, a stepson who is uh, deaf, and uh, and Anna Barry turns up as the as the grandmother in the in the film, which is lovely. And yeah, it won an Oscar. It's a beautiful thing. I think it's called The Silent Child. But um, and I've only noticed this because I'm watching it on quite a big screen. Is that something she's mentioned in Linda Bellingham's autobiography, um, Anna Barry, uh, as being a friend of Linda Bellingham and as being someone uh, who was in a car accident uh, and I think I think lost an eye and had to, because her partner was a plastic surgeon um, and sort of rebuilding I could see I could see a, a little bit of a, 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 a scar there so that's uh, and I, I'd sort of dismissed that and I wasn't going to mention it but it is in the public record because it's in Linda Bellingham's book so I hope it's not prurient of me to mention it so I only mentioned it because I I sort of saw the scar uh, uh, there, only very slight. She's a beautiful, striking woman, um, and, uh, and and obviously plastic surgery and things were in its infancy then. But there we are. So there's an interesting that I hope is not. Proof. Whereas the, the the extra behind the brigadier's hair, this this the the hair that that lady has looks like it's been rebuilt by somebody with a lot of a, a lot of volume. Um, uh, uh, and I think Anna Barry, by the way, is excellent as Anat, and she is exactly as I'd imagined her from from the book. I remember seeing pictures of her and going, that's, that's pretty much what I thought she'd look like. Um, and she plays the part very well and very strange. Um, and, and, um, and I started off this episode talking about Louis Marx, who, yes, had, had a, an episode of Planet of the Giants chopped after it had been recorded, which I think is never a good uh, sign, uh, and then disappears from Doctor Who for ages, then comes back and does this, writes a story that isn't about the Daleks, because this wasn't a Dalek story, this was a time travellers from the future story, you know, the, the, the averting uh, the disaster from the future. I love the lighting in this, and the, I love the lighting in this cellar scene. Um, and um, and so, yeah, he writes this story that doesn't have the Daleks in. And I believe, I think in the scripts, the Ogrons aren't called Ogrons. I think they're called Monster. That's a bit, that's a bit, at least, come on. Yeah, yeah they've got some monsters. And they were supposed to be dog-like, uh, which would have worked, I think. But um, uh, the, the, I think the, the, the ape-like, gorilla-like thing, gorilla-gorilla confusion aside, uh, and they look so good. Um, the costumes, you know, going with the mask looks so good um uh, <laughs> the doctor being locked in a wine cellar and then louis marx doesn't come back to doctor who for ages and then just two stories in quite close succession planet of evil and mask of Andragger in the tom baker era but it's an odd sort of 
he works for three different regimes, um, but isn't a sort of regular uh, for, for, for any of them until and, and the end when he does those couple for, for Tom Baker. And I, I alluded to before that there's a sort of, there's various people who, when Doc Two stuff is being prepared, are, are sort of give, give their time to be a sort of network of helpful people. And uh, this was the first time I think I felt I'd been any use uh, because an old friend of mine, Mark Patterson at university, um, had, had said, because well, you know, all my friends at uni knew I was a Doctor Who friend, said, oh, my, my family know a guy who wrote Doctor Who, Louis Marx. Uh, I think Mark knows Louis Marx's daughter. So anyway, when they were preparing this DVD, I think they were struggling to find him. Uh, and Mark had befriended me on Facebook. And uh, I, like, I like the shooting of this scene. Um, Doctor and Joe are in the cellar, he said, conjuring images for people who are just listening to the podcast. I'll, I'll get this right, I promise. And, uh, and, and Louis Marx, uh, yes, they, they tried Louis Marx's agent and his agent said, oh, I think he's dead. I hate that when people just go, uh, 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 just as, you know, assume, some, assume somebody's dead because they did something a long time ago, especially if it's somebody's agent. Uh, I, I think that's what happened, so I don't wish to be bad mouthing an agent in case that was misreported to me. But they, they, they certainly didn't know where he was, and I think there was an assumption that he died. And I hadn't read he died, and I, I felt that was news to me, so I would investigate. So I actually dropped Mark a line by the wonders of Facebook. And Mark, I haven't seen Mark in 20 years, but he'd always ring up when, when I remember when Moth said my Doc Two scarf went to the West End, he just rang up and said, Oh, you're doing thing, well done, yeah, lovely man. Um, and he uh, and I said uh, I sent him a message on Facebook saying, "You still in touch with Louis Marx's family?" And actually, he was, and they got a message to the daughter. And Louis Marx was poorly, I think, in living in Israel. Um, but what that meant was that the that the, the residuals for this, which would have gone to, I think, an agent who didn't know where he was, actually ended up. Uh, with, he was, you know, he he was reconnected with with monies that were due him. So I think because of that. Uh, I think it might be the only useful thing I've done in the entire history of my association with Doctor Who is ensure that a writer towards the end of his life got a few residuals that he was due when uh, certain people didn't know where he was. Um, and of course he was in Israel because uh, Mark, my friend, is, is, is Jewish um, and, and, the, and the freedom fighters are called Anat, Boaz and Shura, which are, I believe, um, Hebrew-inspired or Hebrew names. Um, and of course... You know that that part of the world has, uh, you know, freedom fighting going on and and sort of guerrilla warfare and various various other bits and bobs. So, you know, he was obviously, uh, uh, you know, trying to evoke some of the the feel of that, if not if not take on the the politics of it. Um, uh, yeah, so that's Jimmy Winston Ashura, who's just just died recently, which is a shame because I would have, uh, uh, he, yeah, as I say, he was on my list, and, and and Steve Broster said he was such a lovely guy, and Mark Ayres knew him as well. I think Mark Ayres went to buy Mark Ayres, the Doctor Who composer, went to buy some sound equipment off this guy, and it turns out it was because because he he did sell sound equipment later in life. That was his job, uh, and it's Jim Jim Winston who went. Oh yeah, I was in Doctor Who. Um, but Shura in the book is, I think, a younger, sort of naiver type of figure, a sort of young blonde guy, uh, to give a slightly different dynamic to the to the three of them. Um, but he leaps about, he's game, and I love this because uh, I think this is where he gets got by a, a an ogron, isn't it? Uh, and he's got oh, he's, is, he good? is he sort of said free to eagle? He's a bit he's slightly cockney. Um, uh, but and this stuff on location looks uh, looks great, yeah. And he's this sort of there's a sort of tough sort of bit of spittle going on in that performance. But that's great. The the the, the way the Ogrons tower uh, uh, and and that costume, they're great. They're great. I love the Ogrons. They're a superb addition to uh, the Doctor Who universe. That's a nice shot through a bit of the set. Um, you know, Doctor Who directors, are, because, because it's science fiction, well, no, I think because of television at that time, because you were shooting 
you know, multi-camera, which you only really shoot a, a, a soap with now, and, and they, a, salt, a soap would probably bulk at that sort of shooting, but uh, with something like Doctor Who, you, you need it. And what I like about Doctor Who of this period is that a, a director will dictate the visual style and indeed the pacing and everything and, and the music, you know, the sound of it, the director, we as Doctor Who fans, you know, can identify a Douglas Camfield story because it's probably shot a bit closer in and with, you know, beads of sweat on people's foreheads and slightly sort of chilling, uh, uh, you know, eth ethereal music and, uh, and certainly, uh, uh, you know, an aptitude for toughness and action uh, and, and, and convincingness in, in the rough and tumble. Whereas other, other directors uh, bring different things. Paul, Paul Bernard, you know, is clearly very visually very ambitious. Ah, now I very much, again, this was another bit I'd remembered from the book where, of course, the soldiers ring. So instead of giving themselves away, the guerrillas go, oh, OK, we well, need to get the prisoners up. But the doctor can't give anything away because somebody's holding a gun to him and Joe is under threat. So he does this thing, which is don't forget to tell the Marines. Now, as a kid, I didn't know what that meant. I'm still not in, entirely sure. Tell it to the Marines. It's something like, isn't it? It's a, it's an, it, it's an idiom. It's a, a phrase that that means um, uh, tell it to the Marines because the soldiers won't believe you. I think I think if somebody said things like, you know, the moon is made of cheese. Yeah, yeah, tell it to the Marines because the soldiers won't believe you. It's something like, like that. So, but what I loved, but without knowing the, the details of it, um, was that the doctor had a thing that he could say that would mean there was a tacit understanding between him and the brigadier, which would tip the brigadier off, which is exciting because you know, all right, he's old prisoner, but the good guys are coming and the, and the bad guys, they're not the bad guys, but the, the other lot don't know. Um, uh, and yeah, I, I really liked the sort of the cleverness and the trickiness of that without without knowing all the exact details of it. Um, and I remember this bit where Joe gets picked forward to the future and assuming that was an episode ending because it's a big, you know, it's a big development. And of course, the mystery of the, the gorilla disappearing early on. Um, but uh, but actually, it's not. It's just a it's just a. It's, it's, it's just another, you know, the, the, the bit of progression for the story. Now that's bold because there's a fade there, a cross fade as the controller spins his chair around and it's not entirely flush, but it, it works. Um, uh, and, you know, you're used to everybody having to freeze for locked off shots, but they go, no, we're gonna have the controller spinning around and we're gonna make that work. She'll be better off dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh dear, because she's in the future where everyone has a shiny face. Um, but, and here we are. I can't choose him as my favourite thing, Aubrey Woods. And I haven't mentioned Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory, although uh, he's the candy man. The candy man can. And I, and I knew he was a, a musical performer because I remembered, I think Jason Donovan was on Wogan. Uh, and, and then they had a few of the cast of Jason is Technicolor Dreamcoat, I think, that Jason Donovan was doing at the West End, and Aubrey Rood Woods was one of them. And that tipped me off that, oh, OK, he's an actor, but he's also a man of, of musical theatre. Um, and, and I think Barry Letts is quite hard on him on the commentary for this on the DVD, uh, which is unusual for Barry Letts because he's a very generous man, very generously minded. Um, but I, I, I think he felt that this performance was slightly out of kilter with everything else. But I think it, I think that's why it works. I think it needs to be. And I think if you've got a waxy face, you've got to, you know, you've got to differentiate yourself from the sort of down and dirty, yeah, sort of the, the, the gorillas who are the, the, the other guys who are a bit more sort of naturalistic and hurling themselves about. This sort of theatrical body language. I mean, he's got silver nails, for goodness sake. He can't, he can't exactly lounge about chewing the cud. Uh, so I know I do like Aubrey Woods very much. I think he's got great presence. Um, and I also think he's very good at suggesting that 
the controller kind of believes what he's saying and I think that the journey that he goes on is really interesting. Uh, he's also, of course, Krantor in the Blake 7 episode Gambit, which if Barry Letts thinks he's a bit camp in this. Oh, <laughs> but again, it's, it's, a, that's a, it's a great episode of Blake 7 that, uh, where everyone is dialed up to 11 on the campometer, <laughs> including uh, John Leeson and Bill Filer and, oh gosh, and Professor Cronotis and Amelia Ducat. It's a veritable feast of uh, Doctor Who types. Uh, having a whale of a time. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, he's very precise in his movements, isn't he? Um, have we ha have I missed the bit? Was I chatting where he said, now you've told me the year. <laughs> Which is very good because I'm not getting into the unit dating thing. Uh, oh. Oh, is there a... I think there's a documentary on this called The Unit Dating Theory, which I... which I ended up... Um, narrating, because I was around and cheap. Um, this is great, because it cuts, doesn't it, to the... It comes in, and then it comes out, and he's on the monitor screen. Love that! That's glorious! That's really mad. Although, again, it was wobbly in the last episode. I didn't notice it was on strings. Sometimes clearing up the picture can make, th can spoil things. I first watched this on a sort of grotty bootleg. It will have looked a million dollars, um, albeit a million dollars like it was underwater and a hundred years old. Um, and, the, and, the, and the sort of framing of the Daleks is, is nice there. Just put my hand in my cup of tea, fact fans. <laughs> Uh, the lighting in the cellar set is very nice. I'm presuming there's not much of it. and uh, But it's suitably atmospheric. Um, and where better? <laughs> if I was John Pertwee, I'd just free myself and just stay there for a bit and go, well, it's, it's a lovely couple of little numbers here. Oh, there's a, there's a cheeky Rioja and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and a very avant-garde avant -garde Merlot. And... Uh, and the Malbec, that's a right obtuse git. Um, oh, they look terrific, don't they? The Oberon was always played by Rick Lester. I remember in, in any picture from Death of the Daleks in Doctor Who magazine, it was always an Oberon, Rick Lester. He thought, and, it was, and I'm sure when I saw the end credits, I was like, there's millions of Ogrons credited, but it's always Rick Lester. He's, he's the fact that it was in his contract. Uh, there's a bit of a delay when, yes, I love Scott Fredericks, but he's his his throwing himself on the floor after being hit by the door acting ha was like it was on a slight, slight, slightly delayed. They showed this bit uh, on the news when John Pertwee died, and I was furious because uh, the Nick Hyam, the BBC arts correspondent, who you think would have liked the arts and television, and well, the television is counted at the arts, which is why people patronise it. Um, but if it's so easy to make television that millions of people watch and that, uh, that lasts for generations, uh, you try it. Um, I, I will come back to Nick Kayam uh, because this is quite important. Um, in the special edition, uh, Greedo shoots first, I think, does he? Um, I think it's such a shame. I, I, the Doctor for me is not somebody that um, disintegrates, even lumbering, um, slow-witted, uh, ape-like factotums uh, of evil machine creatures because he, he could have got out of that without killing the thing and, and seeing as this is the era where the Doctor does lots of lectures to people about you know peace and goodness and all of that sort of thing and the Doctor generally doesn't take life I know he often has his cake and eats it and I know this is a fault with my own liberalism and I, I you know I go no it's very important that the doctor doesn't kill things but he does have unit to blow things up if things do need blowing up he does have unit to machine gun uh, you know I don't mind the brigadier machine gunning the second Ogron because it stops the doctor doing it and and actually that's and I'm aware that Doctor Who isn't necessarily the liberal show I see it as because I know people who see it as the complete opposite of the doctor being somebody who identifies what is evil and fights against it 
uh, and 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 I'm aware my liberalism is is paradoxical and flawed and sometimes contradictory. But I have to see it. I think we create the things we love in our own image. And and, and for me, as somebody that is, I'm not a violent person. I, I uh, I'm a bit of an old liberal. Um, but I also have to acknowledge, and I think genuine genuine liberals do. Which a lot of liberals today don't is acknowledge that. Uh, you know there are fundamental flaws or contradictions in our in our world view uh and i i have to you know i have to accept that i i don't like it when the doctor kills people although uh, you know in doctor who adventures the bad guys get killed all the time even if it's once removed from the direct actions of the doctor but to see him just blatantly disintegrate some something i i find very uncomfortable and doesn't fit in with with uh, with my world view of Doctor Who, which means that that bit probably won't be among the things that I choose of my favourite things. I ran out of time to talk about Nick Hyam, the BBC arts correspondent, and John Pertwee's death on the news. So I will open with that thought. I'm going to leave you on a cliffhanger. I'm going to open with that thought at the beginning of episode three, because now what I have to do is I have to see if I have chosen a favourite thing that is the set is the favorite thing that um, uh, Chris has chosen, and I'm going to choose the "Don't Tell It to the Marines" just because I, I thought it was the Doctor being clever. I thought it was it was a way that the audience were ahead of the 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 the, 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 the baleful force. That the, the the again they're not bad guys, but the people holding the Doctor prisoner kept, keeps him one step ahead of those other guys which makes us as the audience complicit, and that's quite exciting. Uh, but also it's quite educational because it's obviously a thing, but it also works without you knowing what that thing is. Uh, and I'm sure I probably would have asked my mum or something like that. So, uh, you know, and if that adds to the sum total of, of knowledge about the way we express ourselves or idiomatic language or metaphors or whatever, I think that is all good. So uh, tell it to the Marines, uh, Chris Boyle, because the soldiers, won't have chosen the same things as what you have or something my favorite part of episode two is a scene um the doctor and joe are dragged into the cellar by the keyboard player from the small faces and his mates and uh, the light goes off and when the light is switched back on again the framing of the shot is beautiful and the sound design as the lines what do we do now tie them up Echo in the Darkness is excellently subtle. Superb little scene. Oh, well, I... That's it, yeah. I think I talked all the way through that. Sorry about that. That's going to happen. Sometimes the best bits I'm going to... I'm going to have uh, chatted all the way through. But because this is an audio podcast, if I don't say anything, you don't hear anything apart from, you know, the episode on in the background. Um, so Chris and I did not choose the same thing, but I like his choice, uh, even though I didn't fully assimilate it myself. Anyway, uh, that is the end of episode two of Day of the Daleks. As I say, I'm tantalising you with, uh, I'm probably going to have a rant about the way that John Pertwee's death was reported on the BBC News. Um, but for now, um, uh, that will involve a little bit of time travel. So as uh, we can't be doing that, I'm just going to say cheerio. Um, I, was, I was trying to do a clever tie-in with the time travel theme of the story and, 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 and I managed not to, so I've just spouted a little bit of nonsense. Hey, it, at least it proves it's live. Um, some sort of clever segue and some apt bon mot on which to end proceedings. Thank you very much. Goodbye. I hate myself. If you'd uh, like to hear a little bit more from me, uh, but you are too old to enrol on the A-level law course at the FE college that I teach at, but you are a fan of trivia that's liberally punctuated with bad language, um, then you can tune into my occasional podcast, Chris Boyle Didn't Know That. You can find it on iTunes, Spotify, and I'm sure loads of other podcast providers as well. Um, thank you very much, and goodbye.